summer in the UK. But here under the bright tropical lights of the workshop, we've got Bob's, uh, S, uh, no, it's not it's called a GS2. And here it is, GS2, made in Britain, um, a red, well, slightly transparent red with a what looks like a, a coated maple veneer, just barely visible underneath that red on top of mahogany. And we have a maple neck, set maple neck, and you can see some strings falling off here. And there's a reason for that, I'll come back to that in a minute. But Gordon Smith, made in England. Here's a, um, uh, a pick guard that um, Bob wants putting on. So I had to cut it down a little bit from its original SG size, because it's this guitar is slightly different than the SG. Um, we've got an unusual Gordon Smith style bridge here, which is not a bad little unit with these, these flipping, literally flipping saddles that pull there and drop back. No real reason why that. Um, but they hold, hold, hold the strings in place. But as you can see on stretching, uh, two of these have come royally undone, Your Majesty. The balls have dropped off them. Uh, anyway, so this is in for a uh, setup with, sorry, um, you know, a, an extreme low action. Uh, however, the one thing we didn't look at, I didn't see the other day, I didn't notice the other day, I should say, um, made in Britain, not New Britain, out in the Pacific, but good old Britain. Look at that, you can see where they've kind of grafted on the other bit of wood. Um, yeah, the, the thing that I have to observe about this, it's got, got a maple, is that maple? No, actually it's not, wait a minute, let me just get this right. I think the top, the grain goes opposite across in the top, but here it's a sort of natural, slight natural, um, what do they call it, burl in the original mahogany, so that's quite nice feature um but yeah so hmm, let's have a let take you for a close-up look here's what is slightly bothering me so let me just adjust this down sorry um i'm not on headphone mic today because uh, i left the one little tiny converter unit and you know what? i'm not even running on this oh my lord okay well i'm just going to add in the overhead camera at this point now welcome um, yeah, I'll just have to line that up at some point. Uh, <laughs> but so, hang on, let me do something here, right? So we'll waste that one. And what we'll do is we'll go, <laughs> we'll go, look, clumsy moment, visual moment where I switch on the film. Right, so that's what we've done. And it'll help me to psych, psych, sync, cycle, sync the thing up. <sighs> right, anyway, look, the, the, Concern I've got with this guitar, which I didn't notice fully the other day, is you may be, if I keep still enough for long enough, you may be starting to spot it. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's those frets. Now, there's something interesting about this, is if you sort of look up this end, there, mm, and, well, they flatten out a bit in some places, but by and large, they're a little bit more uh, arch shaped. But by the time you get down, towards the middle and the 12th fret, they are starting to look monstrously flattened. And if I zoom in even more, um, you can see they've been absolutely flattened. Now, if I look at particularly the 11th fret there, and the 12th probably, I have to say that I don't think there's any point in me trying to do any extra levelly type work on that. That is, that is about what, when I look at it with my real human eyes, that's about two and a half, three millimeters across the top there, which means it's incredibly worn flat. I mean, this may have been the way it's worn after many, many years of playing. Um, and often you kind of find that guitars reach their own levelness. Um, but I know Bob wants the, this set up in a way that is as low as it can be. Um, there's another little problem with this guitar, and that is that the, uh, the Gordon Smith, and this is a funny little oversight, um, these things here, I think you've lost two strings already, but 
and I can't see this now because it's right in the middle of my view. These things here, they're sort of making their own notches, but they're not very, they're not, they don't hold the strings. So I'm going to have to put all of these strings to kind of default because they want to sit in a certain place. I'm going to have to coat the tops of these is some way that I can actually mark them up and then cut a very slight slot or notch in them to, to get the strings to just sit. Um, and then I'm going to have to sand all those out as well. So it's just a tiny retaining thing because without it, um, certainly on the upper strings, these things were just scraping as I was bending them. They were kind of walking off sideways and it was scissoring or sawing the strings. So it's kind of no surprise that they broke. In fact, they broke at the ball, which is kind of makes me think they're like uh, Harley Benton type strings um, to begin with. But anyway, so um, I, I had this scheduled in today for the workshop um, you know session with this one and as you can see it's a very very flat affair it's a god awful flat affair as David Bowie 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 Gooey Bowie might say um, too close um, there's another thing that you might be able to see here as well with the age of this guitar and it's quite common that over the years the um the wood is shrinking the maple has shrunk a little bit with you know dehumidifying drying out um, and what happens is the frets end up sticking out so they've pushed the filler out and it causes little chips there which eventually just break away and you've got little tiny bits of cracked off finish so there's a you know there's that which feels uncomfortable i just think this is this is going to need a refret really if it's going to continue playing into the future um you know it's past i have to say these are past the level at which i i would recommend spending money on look and if you if you kind of see that one there that is that's incredibly flat i mean i could put you there and zoom you out a bit i could, I could try and assess how wide the flat spot is but i mean i'm not exactly scientific but all right it's not three mils but it's um they're not three mils wide but it's over two millimeters the flat spot and yeah easily two mils and that's that's quite quite something uh so i mean it may well be that they've been leveled before so i think the first thing i'm going to have to do is to go back to bob um now what I'm, I'm going to do while I'm at it, I'm going to take this, this nut off because I've got another challenge at this end, which, oops, sorry about that. This thing is not very steady. So we've got here a familiar, probably familiar to some of you, um, familiar looking uh, Gordon Smith nut. And it, it's a brass nut, which fits nicely with the hardware and stuff. And in one way, what I like about the Gordon Smith nut is that it is uh, screwed into the end not not glued down um, now I'm going to very carefully these have been chewed a bit in the past a little bit what are they telling me are they telling me they are sorry about this out of view I don't think these are don't think they're Phillips, they've got some markings on them. Let's see if together we can, first of all, let's do that up because it's swinging around and driving me mad. Do we think they, these are, yeah, are these posi drives? Yeah, they probably are if I, if I can get them. Okay, look, that's a posi drive in there, isn't it? Yep, so there we go. That's what the iPhone's good for, for all the money I pay for it. Yo-ho. So let's get a posi drive of the right size. Um, let's make a couple of... Now the problem with this, of course, is we need a long-handled posi drive. Right. Now and then, what it means is I have to move it out of your way to get a bite on it. So what the plan was going to be would be to remove this nut and replace it with a tusk one. Um, because it's apparently not keeping great tune and 
cutting slots on brass nuts are, can be a pain. This looks pretty well done as Gordon Smith I'd expect them to be. Um, there we go. That's sort of little, that's a nice little device so they can kind of, technically, you would think you could put it up and down to whatever height you want, although I can't imagine the, I'm not sure that the screw clamping force would overcome the string pressing down force. But I guess what I wanted to do this for was to show you what we're, what we're working with is obviously a flat end to the neck, two screw holes. Um, and a bit of a, a crunchy area there which isn't massively well well finished but it'll do the job now what I what I originally would like to have done on a guitar like this and would highly recommend would be an adjustable tusk nut um, of the type that I fit now the challenge with that is can you get it to sit on the end with enough reach I don't want to be um, flattening this end out um, particularly um, the slots in here look look pretty good they've done a really careful job on it so I'm sort of also of the mind that if it isn't broke maybe we will fix it I mean we can this has been you can see where this has been cut down and it's a little bit rough but I guess it does its job um, it's been it's been done pretty well um, so it may not be all that critical. What, I, what I'm not comfortable about this is that it leans forward as well, this nut. It's not brilliantly, um, doesn't sit very well on this edge. So it tilts. Um, so we've got a fixed size to this, which is, um, let's just measure it, it's about three mils. 3.15 mils, 3.15. And the question is, is can we get, first of all, can we get a, let's do a brass nut on there. Brass nut with its cutouts. And we know it's 3.15. And the question is, can we make a, a tusk one as a direct copy? That's, it's actually 44 mils wide. That's the challenging bit. So it's 44 mils wide in total. And I know from having measured it at home that the, E to E string spacing is very wide too, and it's about 38, or it's on 38. The E to E is 38. So that's that's unusual, um, not a standard size that you'd find. So the question would be, um, first of all, if it, if we wanted to fit an adjustable tusk nut, um, how do we how would we get it to stay on there in such a way that it would do do the job? Um, now, in a way. It's got to sit on the flat base here, which we could flatten a little bit more out to, to widen the amount of flatness here. And, and actually at the moment they've got, they've got what I would say is barely three millimeters. So it's partly why this their brass nut doesn't sit perfectly well. That's a little bit crudely done. So we could gently flatten that out a little bit more. Um, and in doing so, we could widen it a very small amount. Um, but you know, let, let's imagine what the best we can get to. So if I look at one of the adjustable bases, they start out at 5.7 wide. So immediately we've got uh, 5.7. So we've got 2.035. Um, Let's say 2.5 millimeters um, overhanging if we use one of these. Um, now, if we made a, a tusk nut of the right size um, and fitted it in the end here, could just copied this brass one. Um, that's a, that's a, a feasible thing to do. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that if I look closely up at this, this is a bit of a mess in here, and it, I have a feeling where they've done it accounts for why the, the brass nut doesn't sit vertically um, up against this and tilts forward. So there's a little bit of something at the end here that's stopping it. So we'd need to kind of clean both faces of that, which is, again, is not impossible to do. Um, now, the standard height of a typical tusk nut, which this isn't, 
So the height would be good, pretty good for um, raising up. 4.24, that's absolutely fine. The base part of this alone of the taller ones is about 4.5. So um, we've got plenty of height in one of those adjustable nuts to allow this to drop down a little bit. And what I wanted to do was give basically better, much better performance than this brass nut um, without um, modifying the end so that it was easy to refit the brass nut uh, um, should um, Bob want to do that in future because aficionados of these kinds of guitars will like the original, which is totally understandable. Um, so, you know, if you want to leave it. The, the difficulty about the nervousness I've got about that issue, of course, is, and, and it's something that Bob's asked me to do, is if I fit that, then it's going to de-originalize anyway, because we're going to put one, two, three, four, five screws in the screw holes in the top, which seems quite radical. So I'm not going to do them just yet. I'll take a picture of how it looks. This is a, I think this is probably a shallow, and it doesn't, it has Germany written on it, but it doesn't have any other branding. Um, but it's a, it's a fine looking beastie. Um, and as you can see, these little bits sort of tilt back and you push them forward and put the strings in, which is a, a very simple mechanism. Um, but it's the, it's these strings. Now, if I were, strings, it's these frets. If I were to measure the height woodsness of these frets, they're just over half a mil in some places. Um, 12th fret, 0 0.67, 0 0.61, 0.61. I think this one's about the worst, 0.59. So, and there's one of the errant balls, if you excuse the expression. So, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause this because I'm gonna talk to Bob about it. So I'm gonna get me a little container for these bits. And like I say, I can also um, go and find me, well, I can make one of these out of a, a blank. Um, now, technically, I could probably, Make one of those out of, even better, out of a, a, a make one out of a tusk um, saddle because that will be exactly 3.2, which is fractionally bigger than that. So that's probably a better material because I'm going to have to. I would have to cut the um, uh, cut the slots myself, which is fine. I'll cut down from a given height on this one because it's we need to we'd need to have it ending up sitting firmly on there um, and so cutting down would be by far the better option so a tusk nut sitting there even screwed in like the brass one means they're interchangeable um, in fact we I'd still want to just square this off a little bit so even when that goes back on in the end it sits better but that would be the the simplest way I think Adding an adjustable one is nice, but uh, I'd just rather the performance was simple and straightforward. So I'm going to sacrifice or use this as a, a blank to work on. Um, so into, into the box of parts will we'll go the important bits and we'll park this um, for later. I'll take a couple of pictures now or I'll just do a video view. Right, let's take this green stuff off now. I've used it for marking it. I did this off camera. Um, just had to trace the, or cut this to, so it would fit and just clear the, um, clear the uh, switch. Because actually when you put this on originally, it hit the switch or it had to be sitting way out and then there's a big gap in this one. So I've, I've balanced the gap out so it looks much better. But they will look like that. So let's do a quick, oops, oh, sorry about all this bad view. There's the overhead view uh, for Bob to see. That's the scratch plate, how it will fit. Um, and then let's just have a, a little look down here, see what we've got. Well, wow, they're stiff. We've got these bridge posts, but that's quite a, quite a grungy bit of stuff under there. I mean, you can't see it very well, but it, it's, um, it's got some cutout going on there. Um, nice um, shallow as well, I would say, made in Germany bridge. Um, also, what I was going to do when the time is right 
it's just flattened out. I don't know if you can see, but it's got a curved pickup ring on it, which seems a bit of a shame considering it's a flat top. So I was going to just sand that level as well. Okay, so my verdict on this is I'm going to take the moving bits all off, put them in there. Everything else is safe, nothing's moving, that's good. I'm going to put this back in a bag and stash it out of the way. And uh, oh, it just would be good to do while I'm here. Let's measure the width of the frets um, in mils. So we know what we're dealing with if we're going to replace 2.8, 2.8. Okay, 2.8 and whatever high you want. So, I think I will stick it on here so I know what I'm doing. Uh, frets with 2.8 height question mark. And that then becomes, what do we want? What's in that region? So sometimes you're constrained by what's in that region. Um, and sometimes you're, you can, if you want, 1.3 you can find them, but you might not be able to get exactly uh, 2.8. Now I think what would look absolutely fantastic with this is Evo Gold. That's without a doubt that would work perfectly with this. And I happen to have a new set here that I was going to use on mine. Whoops. Um, and this is this is Jumbo Jumbo. So it's about 1.4. And uh, let's zoom out. I'll just quickly check again. It's about 1.4 and uh, look at the, uh, 2.8. So that's, that's, a, that's a jumbo, it really is. Uh, oh, that's 2.82. Okay, so actually the it's about 1.4 high. In fact, it is 1.4. So 2.8, 1.4 on the on the Evo Gold. It's a premium cost because it's you know, it's not cheap to buy. Um, we worn through the finish here to the wood, but that's that would stay. Um, they, I think they sprayed this first, then put the frets on. Um, that's my initial feeling about it. It doesn't look like it's got the carpet of finish going up over the frets that you, you see when it's done the other way. Okay, so that would be my recommendation. Evo Gold frets for this. It would blingify this beautifully. Um, <coughs> But that will have to <clears throat> hold off for a minute because we need to make, you know, Rob needs to make an executive decision on that. Okay, that's it for now. We'll come back to this one shortly. We do need this, much as I don't want to need it. I think we do need it. And I think in this case, we're going to have to be specific. We're going to have to say, we'll do one at a time. GS. Refret one. GS refret one. That's all we're going to do. That's all we have to do. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? So that's what it is. We know what it is. Then we'll do. Oh, we're supposed to get to keep a record of it on here next. So GS refret. And then we've got CMI, refret, and we go a series of numbers. <laughs> we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we're on shoot number one. <coughs> That's going to be tied out now. <coughs> Okay, so let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Smack. Right. Okay, we are back to it. Hello, welcome back to Real Love Guitars. Um, so this is the Gordon Smith GS2. And since the last time I saw you, um, I've been fret buying. And up on the wall there, we've got the GS2 frets, which are there. Now, According to my measurement, the GS2 seems to go from 12 to 14. I'm not entirely sure if it does, um, but it may be. I can't find anything online that says it does or doesn't. Similarly, there is no, doesn't seem to be any sort of hard and fast 
um, statement about what the finish actually is. So I've done a couple of tests in various hideaway places, um, which have confirmed that the two guitars I've got to refret tonight, or start the refret pr process tonight, this one and the n vintage CMI Telecaster, which is sitting wonky up there. Um, my tests, laboratory testings, show that both are in fact poly finishes. <clears throat> so that's fine. Um, so that means I have options with this. So with this one, what we've got is beautiful, massive jumbo frets. And the reason why is, look at the width of these things. They're hugely wide, but they're also completely flattened. So what I'm going to do is, um, on this one, I'm going to pull the frets out. Um, we're going to uh, notice the edges here. We're going to lose, or it's already losing the little edge end covers because, or end fills because the the frets are, um, how should we say, they are uh, sprouting. When the frets sprout, um, they stick out and push their way out. So. That's not a surprise. Oops, that's not a surprise because they're, you know, the, the maple here has dried over the years. Now, we've also got some dirt here too, which I thought would be nice if we're going to refret it. Why don't we clean this up and respray it as well? And if you look at the way it's done, it's done with a sort of satin finish, which is fine, um, but it's also done with a lot of, there's a kind of horizontal, um, this way sanding um, so it leaves it sort of feeling satin-ish but it's got a little bit of texture to it but anyway I think what we should do is look at cleaning this back up if we're going to make the frets brand stinking new which we are we're going for these humongous great um, jumbo evo gold frets so this whole thing's going to have the most beautifully bling gold finish um, we'll we'll yeah we'll refret this and um, Re, well, sort of remove the frets first. We'll sand this back. Um, I might look at doing it just by hand rather than using a radius block because the, by hand will preserve the, the shift in the radius. The frets currently are, um, they're sort of probably, if I'm right, they're probably 12 at the moment. I put 12 and a half, but they're probably 12 the way I bent them. Um, now, whether or not they it actually gets to 14 is anyone's guess, but we're, there shouldn't be any problem um, pressing them on if it is 14, but we'll double check once the frets are out. Um, okay, so what else about this guitar? Well, that's that for now. So um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to do these alongside each other in terms of sequences because it, it pays to be on the same... Hey, don't bother focusing, will you? I don't need to focus. Blimey. Uh, it pays to be on the same focus <laughs> same um, stage with both of them I think uh, although it makes filming a bit odd um, yeah so where am I I hope this is working because I'm not sure what I lost my little plug-in thing which I then bought two more exactly like this brought this one up to the workshop just now and then found the original one which I couldn't find the last time I came up <laughs> anyway so all right well there's, we've done a test, we know what the material is, um, we know what the kind of state of the underlying fretboard is. It's worn It's worn on here from years of playing. The frets, I think, um, we, we had some discussions. Oh, why is the autofocus not working? Um, I haven't read my instructions on how to use this phone, have I really? Um, we, we had some discussions and came to the conclusion this is a mechanical flattening. Somebody's leveled the hell out of these in the past. Um, you don't get play where you know, nobody plays the perfectly equally between these tracks so that it comes out as one flat rail. Uh, if you had massive wear, you'd have ruts in each of the, um, in each of the, what's it? This is just, uh, I'm going to have to go off in a minute and um, switch this off and see, uh, see if I can make this thing stay in focus because otherwise it's going to be pretty crap. So I will see you in a minute. Okay, so I am now going to get into the mode of lifting up these frets. Now, um, I guess what I what's difficult to know is where to look in this because this isn't refretting. Isn't something I is it something I often do on camera? Do you know what? I'm not entirely sure, but even if it isn't, <coughs> I think it's something I don't do on camera very often. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the process by um, using the 
I need to get I get need to get access to it. Um, let's do that. I'm going to start by using my patented uh, blade lift method to lift up the um, or attempt to lift up the frets. So you can see that first of all we get a little bit of uh, blade under there and it lifts up. There we have it. Up it comes. Now there's a little bit of flake there. So there's a couple of options we've got and the truss rod is really difficult to get to on this thing. Um, I'm looking at the, the amount of flake on there and that's quite quite a lot but it tells me or suggests that um, it's glued. Uh, the glue is lifting up the material there, lifting up the maple. So that comes out in one sort of big go. Um, don't think there's any Maybe there's no glue in there. I'm not even sure, actually. I mean, the new ones will sit on top of that, so it's not a problem. So but we just have to keep an eye on that. That came out very easily. So I'm going to do the same again here. Let's, let's get the fret under there and get as much... I'm trying to get as much of the uh, blade under there as possible. And then I just get the first edge to lift like that. And you probably can't even see it lifting there at all. And the same here with a little twist. Tiny lift. And that's all I'm after is just to get this thing started so that I can come along again if I want to with my fret puller lifter things and just ease everything out that way. But this is the start point so we don't get any crush edges, uh, crush marks right on the edge, which is often what you can get when you're pulling frets with these fret puller plier type, type things. So this is quite nifty you just have to be a little bit careful and confident in your handling of the blade because as you can see i've got a fair bit of force going on but it's just to get the beginning of the lift so you know i, I show how to do this in my second ebook um, um i don't kind of if you're not confident you haven't got good hand strength it's not necessarily something i would recommend you do now once I've done that and I can't leave them all just lifted up because I've got I get run out of space to get this under there so eventually come to the point that I have to remove each one um, so using the fret pliers which are a little bit kind of getting worn out but they're okay this just got crud from doing other jobs um, but because I've got the initial lift going on there this is a much simpler task to get these out and they do they show just how flat these frets are um, but they're coming out with uh, any big fight um, but they've already broken the end seals because of the shrinking wood so the wood's receded taking the finish with it um, of course the metal frets haven't receded so they've stayed right where they are and uh, the result is that the end finish just gets um, popped out really I suppose you could call it. Let's see if I can, oops sorry, let's try and get you a half decent view of this process. Yeah, must remember to hit the microphone, must remember to reset. So this one's already lifted so the first thing I'll do is just show you pulling this one up. So you know, a little bit of a lift there and then a walk along like that. This one is lifted as well, so we'll do that one and then we'll pull the next one. Okay, so where are we? Oh yeah, there we are. So this one, we'll go in with the blade. So I'm just finding a way under the tang, there we go. Sorry, under the crown of the fret. So that's in nice and tightly, see that? Now what I'm going to do is up close, I'm going to put a twist. There you go. And you saw it lift, and that twist was enough to lift this end of the fret. Uh, and it put pressure on the, the actual finish here, but it's a flat pressure um, because it's spread over the, the width of the blade. So it kind of allows you to do it without focusing the uh, pressure too hard on one spot, which if you do it with the, <laughs> the fret pulling pliers, these bits here, tend to put pressure right on the edge of the fingerboard, giving you a little dent usually, um, which you can sort of sand out as you go, but it's 
it's just ideal. I mean, it's not ideal. You don't really want to start out with that and have to fix it or remember to correct it, if you like. So blade, eventually this blade gets a bit kind of grotty and doesn't want to play. So I will probably exchange it for another one. You can see I just, I've come to prefer doing this the, this way, being very careful with the blade instead of um, taking the risks of marking the end of the fingerboard. So obviously I'm keeping my hands well out of the way so the blade isn't going to do me any harm. Right, so look, we're up at 12 already. Um, just getting sort of set up for each one, really get the blade under as far as it will go. Now eventually, on some guitars, what happens is it breaks the breaks the snap-off blade because um, it's just doesn't want to play. But this is this has been fairly cooperative, and we can basically get all the way up to here doing the same technique. So we just you know able to avoid or do the least damage to the end of the slot, I suppose you could call it. So this one's struggling to get under there. There you go. That first little lift is all it needs. Now on the on this one, as I say, the board is very thinly um, finished in a, in a, oh I should put a, just make a note, the GS is a, is a matte to satin um, finish in poly. So we know it's poly, we know it's matte or satin. Um, now we could spray gloss and wire wool it back to a, a satin sheen. Um, this one's struggling a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the, the truth is, any um, any satin finish, if you if you touch it enough, it tends to end up shinier. It won't become fully gloss, but it, it will it will shine up. And particularly if you've got your if it's your clothing that's touching it, if you've got a, a, a satin finished or a matte even finished body, um, lots of clothing rubbing onto it. Oops, I've forgotten you, left you behind. Um, lots of clothing rubbing against it will create, or hands, you know, where you strike the, where you're strumming, it will create shiny spots. Um, but this this one looks a pretty matty. Actually, it's not completely matte. But it's it's on the matte side of satin, I would say. So, my my only consideration is is what do we what do we finish it with now? Because it's poly, we can use poly, um, but we're not we're not obliged to. Um, so nitro sits over poly perfectly well. In fact, Gordon Smith offers that as a a kind of one of their re or one of their custom finish options. Apparently, I saw and looking online tonight. Um, so they they do this sort of colour stain stain and or trans colour um, and then they, they offer a choice of um, well they offer a, 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 a diversion or you know a detour and you can instead of a presume finishing in poly clear coat you can then um, you can specify nitro for the clear coat. So that's obviously a good example of um, uh, nitro being used over the top of a poly colour layer. Um, and clearly they do that, I suppose, because people either like the final coat feel or look of poly or they kind of, uh, sorry, nitro, or they like the idea of letting it wear or, or check uh, age the way nitro does. Um, and of course, what you'll get is checking in the clear coat, but you won't necessarily, you won't, it won't create the same effect in the colour finish, um, which may be a little bit different from a, a truly vintage all nitro guitar. Okay, so we're almost down to the last one, and you can, you can just see, heading for the last one. Um, so anyway, yes, so we, we've, so the, the issue here is it's done in, originally in poly, we can redo it in either poly or nitro. And then I've got, at the moment in stock, I've got clear, um, well I've got most things at the moment, but 
I've got some gloss poly in spray can form. I've got satin poly in spray can. I've probably got matte poly in spray can form. I've also got clear gloss in uh, clear poly, sorry, clear gloss poly in waterborne form, which I can spray using the HVLP sprayer. Um, I've also got uh, a clear satin nitro that I can spray using the um, HVLP sprayer. So I'm kind of, uh, for me it's a little bit of a question of which technique do I want to use, would I prefer to use. Do I want to spray it from a can or do I like the idea of spraying it from a uh, from the HVLP sprayer. I've got quite a lot of satin nitro spraying to do coming up and I'm I'm right now looking for if anyone's got one uh, a clear weather window um, so this is the GS2 original original frets but oh my word are these going to be are these things going to be superb just have a just have a little taste of that while we're at it yum 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 I mean, ignore the edges because, of course, we haven't trimmed it or anything. But just, just imagine you're looking at the. Now, do you, the one thing I'm not concerned exactly, but I. Oops, sorry. One thing I've got got my sort of mental eye on, if that if that's a saying, is um, I know. Sorry, I just hit that as well. Uh, these frets were so low that anything is going to feel huge under under finger as it were um, so I'm sort of cons only concerned that that um, Bob's experience of playing this is going to be very very different right from the off so uh, and it, but it would be even if we used sem uh, medium jumbo frets because these original ones were so low it will just anything will be a massive change so it's kind of I think we agreed in for a penny in for a pound because these uh, these wide ones on the Gordon Smith would have been quite tall at some point because I don't think they used just flat wide wide low ones. These appear to be almost identical as far as I can measure it in the uh, tang department. We're ranging from in the gaps between tangs 53 it seems to be the 53 51 and here we've got 52. 61 there is some grime or something but 50 51 so that um, these are an absolutely tiny fraction wider than the originals but not enough that would give me any cause for worry what I think is, uh, well, what I will do straight away let's, let's get the fret slotting saw and give this a clean through and this happens to be uh, a good a nice width anyway this is a standard 50 for width anyway, so this is this will be a good, um, it's like you know, just opening up the slots to clean them out, sort of thing. Now, but one thing I'm going to do right now before we go any further is I'm going to do obviously going to do a lot of work on this guitar. So the first thing I want to do, let me think, I've got two things to do, but let's see if we just stick with the, yeah, we'll stick with the fret work first. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cover these over. And I'm going to cover the edges down here very, very thoroughly and not just with green tape in this case. I'm going to use quite a bit, um, which is kind of expensive, but hey. Um, no, ah, right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the, the frog tape at the moment doesn't go across the joint here. I'm just going to stop it short of the joint because we may need to consider masking that off if we're going to do or we consider where the extent of any edge finishing we're going to do comes to because we are going to need to refinish this edge or not perhaps not refinish it we're going to need to fill these little uh, bits there's a, little, there's a little glitch there on one of the little flake out or something on one of the dot markers but anyway yes we're going to need to refill this now the it doesn't require a complete refinish and in a way it'd probably be better to avoid over spraying on the side of here if, if it's just these that need filling and we could probably fill these with 
some other um oh well, let me think we can now what we're going to do is we're going to make the metal come to the edge because it's gold and it will look good we'll do like before so we will end up as we bevel we'll end up cutting in a little bit onto this finish so we may require some some edge very fine amount of edge refinishing and it would be a case of um it'd be a case of thinking about where our extents are um it's clear that this has a different finish a kind of finish to this because this is satin matte and this is clearly high gloss so they've done this in two separate bits anyway what i'm just looking to do right now is i want to protect most of all i want to protect the area down here so that nothing with my fretting tools is going to um, crash into the uh, finish at this point and we'll worry about or consider the extent of spray respray or reef touch up finishing in a minute so we could consider just respraying this bit here and um, we get a nice flat finish we can clean the slots out we'd be ready to re uh, refret and then we could consider um, touching up these little bits here later with either a clear resin or um, you know just a maybe hand applied water-based poly something that we can then just hand sand back to blend in because I don't think I want to go with huge there's nothing wrong with all of this it's, this is great so I don't want to sort of start encroaching on all of that side just because we've got some small fret end bits to tidy up but again they, we don't really we ideally we won't need to finish them we'll need to just over touch over to um, seal maybe to cover the end of the gold but actually if the gold's totally flush it may be that we don't even need to do that but what tends to happen is you tend to get a bit of um, a little bit of uh, your um, uh, beveling block will tend to just cut against the finish there it's almost impossible not to unless unless you um, prep your friend uh, cut your frets to length off off the neck but then actually the problem with that is you never get them flush finished so they look a bit naff an alternative as it's you probably figured out is to um is to undercut and leave an end gap and fill those with um some sort of i don't know plastic wood or something a little maple colored filler um that's not a bad way to do it and that allows you to again just fill these and then sand them back i think that 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 for me takes a bit of the pressure off the end beveling because we're we're not end beveling quite so hard onto this finish so that's another way of doing it um got to just you know make the call based on what's going to leave the best um best result i suppose now what we've got here oh no oh no oh no oh hellfire i gotta take this home i just forgot to do something the other day bugger my rush to get back um you probably guess i forgot to empty out my spray gun and as a result i've got i'll have dried um <laughs> dried poly, sorry noise dried poly so i'm gonna have to soak this gun and take it apart completely oh well sort of no surprise really alternatively i could well, i could also fire some water practically water through that might help as well so i might rig this up later on off camera and shoot some vapor out the into the hallway just to try and clear it up okay well that serves me right that will teach me um right so coming back here so what i'm looking for is something to reach just to there and protect Sorry, protect the edge as it comes along next to alongside the fingerboard nearly use a little bit extra to fold down here so it's just you know in case whatever the um the saw does it can't bounce off well the other thing of course is I want to protect this way because the saw to get the saw in I might 
might miss out the saw on there, but if I can get it in most of the way, it's probably a good thing to do. But as I say, I'm just going to make sure that this bit here is carefully broke off. Like so. And then I would run some of this here, like this, and up to there, like that. And this bit on there. So all of this that's in line of, first of all, the saw has got a bit of Gorilla Glue. So in case I were to miss anything, okay, I'm going to start here and I'm going to just do so. Now you can see that in order to get in there, I have to tip a little bit going up the hill here on both these. So I can just go uphill, stop, come back, do it the same for here. There's a little bit of finish breaking out you can hear. Um, that's just the poly that was in the gaps before, or covering the gaps, I should say, the end, end bit. Now I can go over the whole top and we've got the whole thing. So this one now, I'm going to go back in that direction. Um, so you're just cleaning it through and should I miss with either this end or that end I've got the uh, got the black tape to sort of keep me safe <laughs> right and then this end once I passed here which we are I can go up here and I'm going to go in and up for these to begin with because if you're not careful when you do that if you pull out it can flake the uh, finish out. If you push in, it sort of limits limits the damage. Um, so these are very clean slots. There's almost no sign of glue or anything. I don't think they used glue at all. But so this is just to start off to make sure it's there's no actual obvious obstacles getting in the way. And once we've done this, then it's on to considering the. Um, the finishing, but I'll do a double check on the radius and see if we can learn any more about it. So as I've said, probably on every video where I've done any fretting, Okay, we're now over the top. We should be at the end. Um, in every um, fretting video, one thing I've always stressed is that the secret to successful fretting is to is in preparation, um, in in pre preparing your your uh, frets first, and then or alongside preparing your fingerboard. So, for example, running through here to remove. I need to try to. We're going to need to do it again later after the uh, any sanding of the fingerboard. But this is a good first feel to see if there's any kind of obstacles in the frets in the slots. Um, and you can feel here that they're they're running smoothly. Um, if you know at this point that they need very slightly widening, you can start to help that process by very slightly twisting this blade a little tiny bit and just dragging it with a bit of pressure. What you're going to be doing is just uh, slightly loosening or increasing the size of the slot so it won't, it won't um, either grip, grip too hard or it won't push the, uh, push the wood apart as you put the new frets in. And you can always, um, you can always get a sense of it by um, getting one of your frets. In fact, this is the this one from down here, but you can sort of start by just hand pressing it in and that feels very, very close to being a perfect fit. Um, again, you know, looking down at it, almost everything about that is, is a good fit. Um, might be. Yeah, 
I mean that. I think we'll use glue and um, we'll use water based glue because that cleans up beautifully. Um, but we'll come back to that. Um, so we'll use wood glue, I should say. But we'll come back to it in a minute or later when we've got the um, sanding done. So let's look at the radius again. We said this was 12. Um, certainly, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this. Oh, I can include you in there. Um, looking at this, uh, it's difficult to say. It's not actually 100% consistent. Um, I'll have another check online before I do anything. I mean, it could be that, could argue that's probably, could be a, a 14 inch radius. Um, it's actually not bad to fret with a 12 uh, if it is a 14 consistently. Um, I would say that's probably, it, it, if anything, the last two frets down here flat. Um, but I would say that overall, that's, that's, uh, hmm. would it go to 16, really? Uh, could be 14 to 16 as the last bit, maybe. Hmm. It's a bit too rounded for 16. So, yeah, my best 14 to 16, I would say. Um, I think we're with the fret wire. We're in. Um, we're in a range that, with a little glue, this will sit down beautifully well where it needs to sit. So, oops, if I look at this, it will curl on the end there. But if I press that down, fix that down, that's going to sit nicely. Um, the one thing I might just look at on this and do a comparison is the depth of the. Uh, the depth of the actual tang, and there may be there maybe needs a little bit more work before I go ahead. Uh, this is very difficult, very difficult indeed to measure. Um, so it's a sort of bit of sideways guesswork, really. You can read anything you want it to read, really. Um, so that isn't really that. No, it's definitely not. Be nice to nice to know what it really is, and that won't fit in there. It's too fat. Um, if you do it sideways, it won't tell the truth because it will go off at a funny angle. Uh, well, that's claiming to be 1.99 mils depth. Um, by comparison, holding this in the same way. This is coming out the same. Um, so, uh, yeah, neither of them, see, they don't, none of them sit down immediately because they've got the tangs to kind of push in, and the tangs will sit in different places so that none of them will drop down the full, the full length. The question is, is, do I think the slots cut in here are deep enough to accommodate? And that's all I can really make the um, assessment on. In some ways, sometimes I do it, check it like the following. I will place that in there like so, and I will lift that out like that. Sometimes you can just push it in the sharp point. Push it in like that, drop the flat edge onto it, and check that there. Move my finger out of the way. Yeah, they about match up perfectly. So, hmm, you could say if you didn't want to be caught out, because it's not a great look if your fret tang happens to be through a quirk of history, um, slightly taller than your um, the original one, and if they've done it to the exact depth, then you might want to consider changing the depth of your slot. Um, and it's not a bad thing to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to push this up the hill a little bit, as it were, to give me a slight increase in depth. Um, so, again, we're just working with what we've got. Now we can see that that's, that is actually a fair bit above the depth 
we're working with so we can take it down again start there and we can push up until we're a little bit extra not too much so that's a that increases the depth a little bit how we assess it against the tang the real depth of the tang is anyone's business really truth is you want more than less so if we start with let's start with this one because it's the most difficult one to get to if we uh, do a little bit of sawing work now and again watching carefully our our ends of the saw in this particular part of the, the game and then we can do that here like this again watching the front end of the saw now <laughs> that's added a little bit of depth to it clean it out <laughs> and then I'll do another test with the two sharp bits of the blade and I think we'll be soon be there so it might be worth just going through everything and getting that extra little bit of depth just to be on the absolute safe side wow very difficult to see we're talking a thing that doesn't really want to be measured very well um, which is the tang. You can't really cut the tang off and measure it separately from everything else. You don't get a sort of a sample tang. Could I have a sample tang, please? Hmm. So, again, I can feel it's, uh, it's kind of rubbing against the... When it, when it rubs against the wood, or the MDF, I should say, of the guide, then we know where we're at the right sort of place. It's going to be obviously much easier in the other parts of the neck than this. That's always going to be the slow and careful bit. So I think a little bit more rather than less is going to be the watchword here. Um, we can, for example, we could take a spare piece, which we've got over there, um, we could tap it in and just see without any glue how it sits and um, you know, give us that also a clear view on the first uh, the first one of the lot but I think that will be good at that height setting but we'll have to do all of them so I'll do that offline um, keep that one ready because it's a bit boring um, and then I think the next bit to come back to is come back with a decision about how to sand this back to the bare wood um, and what it's going to take. Now, obviously, the first thing I want to take into consideration is to mask off this part of the guitar because I don't want any um, anything getting in the way and hitting that end of the guitar and causing problems. So I shall go as far as expending some more Gorilla tape in that general direction. So that's a bit of protection and also just for fun we can kind of just give the those tunes a little bit of a protection in case I run it with the sandpaper past there okay so yeah I'm going to do the widening while it's like this um, obviously I have to be careful because I can't take the um, I can't take the neck off this it's a set neck so I'm going to do the thing and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll make a decision on the finish um, We'll make a decision on I think I think the best bet will be to do a right now where's the stuff mm. we'll do a shall we let us do something like the plastic wood wherever that is now gone and it was knocking around here and of course I've now lost it somewhere um, it was a nice woody color I mean we've got other wood filler over here standard uh, natural wood filler that would do. Just thinking of a, a way of um, the you know, wood filler takes a while to dry and it's not very strong. So if I can just find where I lost the uh, plastic wood, we should be all right. But wood filler at a push might work. Um, did the uh, no, that's not the wood filler up there. A little plastic wood. 
uh, I can't find plastic wood, but I have got Velcro, finally, which is uh, amusing. Oh, there's a the plastic wood. Look at that. Okay, so what I would be looking for uh, is to get me a little plastic wood. I'm going to do a little test here. Um, we'll put a tiny bit in the into the ends of one of these, and then we'll, we'll sort of cut it out a bit later, just to try it out. So a little bit of this stuff. It's a sort of I don't know what you call it, woody colour. So let's just hold that there, and I'll take a tiny bit. And we imagine that we've got an overcut, sorry, an undercut of um, the Evo Gold to fill in. Um, so I'll put a bit of this in, and then if I can get it to stay in, and then I guess we would have. Um, all we'd have at the end is the need to very gently uh, sand it, sand it back. So getting it to stay flat is probably the hardest bit right now. So there's a little fill, um, and we'll, we'll cut it out later with the saw when I get to it. But it'd be just worth, so I can have a, a look and see if it, it's a decent colour. Um, so an undercut with a fill might be better than running the tang all the way to the edge here which means we have to we have to um, bevel right to the edge and that means we've got to bevel with the end block at least um, past the touching point and down into um, right down into um, you know, a couple of millimeters down the side of this thing so trying to minimize the amount of damage done in refretting um, if I a, a sort of totally scaredy cat way of doing it would be to start off by taking a fret chopping the tang undercutting it um, then we would snip the end off like this and we would place it there oops let's do not do the one i've just put some stuff in let's do i oh know we have to silly man right. that's not even the right one that's from the far end let's take number two that we're actually on <coughs> grip. Right, we cut a tank, cut an overhang, cut a square end, tidy in at the end I suppose. We'll go to number two because that's where we're currently at. Now we know that we want um, a bit of overhang and we want this metal to exactly to the edge of here but no more because really what we want is to bevel it up if anything. So then we have a, a length here that we can see. We can remove this. We can now cut to that length exactly then we can do an underhang on this point and then we have our fret or ostensibly cut almost perfectly to size but what we can guarantee is if there's anything sticking out it's only going to be above this line here it's not going to be nothing below the edge of the fingerboard is going to be sticking out um, so that allows us to uh, to cut it back with an angle um, so we barely have to touch the vertical edge of this and that will preserve um, do a lot to preserve the, the finish on the edge now I don't know how long this stuff takes to set but presumably some time um, so that's the sort of the idea of doing it this way um, I suppose the what you if you really cannot touch the uh, the sides at all a way of dealing with this right now would be to um, tweak this until you're absolutely certain that it's exactly the right length and that might be a sort of a hand sanding process um, which is time consuming but it does work so we can just sand this until we are absolutely certain it's the right length. And the, the key thing that makes it look good or bad is if it's exactly the right length. The beauty of the beveling file is that it makes sure everything is physically the same length because it, it dictates that because it's following the line here of the edge. But it does that at a cost of scraping some of the finish. Now, if you're going to do it this way, um, you've got to be a, a lot more persistent in sanding or scraping the end of the fret until you get to exactly 
the length that you want and even then it won't be completely flush because it's um you know it's not being dictated by this edge but that's that's pretty close um and now if we really don't want to touch the edge then the thing you would do is to get this and bevel it into uh, an angle which i i kind of often do by hand and i i can't tell you what the angle is but it's a you know it's about 30 to 40 degrees and it's at a certain held angle in the hand and it feels a certain way and you do it and lo and behold you get um, a pre-beveled fret at exactly the right length with the barest minimum requiring um, cutting with any block now if you can do that uh, you can pretty much do it all without the block and that means we don't do any further damage to the edge here which would be nice to avoid having to widen the spray area and make you know things get a bit muckier but you know that takes some time beauty of the edge beveling block is that you're dictated this this is the guide of course being the guide as soon as you get flush with the edge it, it by definition cuts into the finish you can't avoid it as simple as that there's no way of around it so uh, if you it, you know sometimes with old guitars and guitars I definitely don't want to touch the edges of I will do exactly that and make them all fit by hand um, and the the only downside as I say is occasionally if one is even a fraction off by the time you've finished um, or, or when you put it in you don't quite get it seated exactly where you thought you just get a little tra British Rail train tracks in the summer I call it in the summer heat where they melt and buckle and go off sideways but uh, that's you know if you take the time to do that on all your frets you cut down the scraping heavy duty brute force job um, by a huge amount and you could see that that wasn't exactly onerous so I'll probably do that with the camera off get them all as close to the exact length with a tiny bit hanging over if anything in other words not undercut um, and then I'll have them I'll come back and we'll do the um, I'll do the widening I'll do the cutting to the length and then we'll be ready to refinish the fingerboard okay we're running again we're running again oh hold on hold on i've got to do a thing so we've done one we've done one of those and here we're on number three so this is oh geez gs2 number three although i don't have the head mounted thing on so just coming back to this, I've just been doing some sanding, as you can probably tell, of the um, other guitar in this deal, the CMI. So I'm just going to have a look at this one. And I'm going to get my, my 240 grit sandpaper out. I'm going to lightly, like 120, I said 240, where's that gone? I can't find it, I'll get a bit from somewhere else. Then I'll get some from here, and the idea will be to I want to just sand down by hand and see where we get and whether it's going to be a doable thing. So what I guess you would prefer to be is down this business end where we're looking at the wear and tear on there. So I'm kind of hoping at this stage that it proves to be very light finishing and that we can kind of get down through it very quickly. Uh, I'm just going to hand follow the radius here and see how we go. And we're not far off. I can see it's cutting to wood, just wood, fresh wood down there. So that would be the ideal situation is to, is to cut through quite quickly. Um, without having to use a radius block and risk um, changing the shape. And I would sort of follow the radius all the way through. So this is, this is going to be, in some senses, easy to refinish because it looks like it will, it's, it's achieved its look with a very thin, a relatively thin finish to begin with. So, um, Hopefully we'll be able to just recreate that. Now this has been, um, you know, a really thick finish. And 
a use of the radius bolt would be kind of feel like more possibly more required to cut through but it seems to be pretty light um, I'm hoping to take it all back clean it up without needing to get the radius block out now as you remember I'm all tidied up at that end so nothing is going to skid off and damage the finish anywhere so I can comfortably work on the fingerboard. I haven't covered the sides or anything, I'm just working on the flat surface here and letting it sort of stop and run to the edges naturally. I mean, it, you know, if, if it, I'm not sure it was designed as a compound radius, but if it was, um, then, and you had no choice, for example, you had to remove very thick finish. Um, it's one of those things that, um, you know, if you get agreement from your client, it, you can consider re-radiusing it. It's an all over 12, which would be um, hardly any different in feel from what it is now. But again, that, that's the only kind of thing that you do um, in a, under a certain contingency and with agreement. Um, Because it's one of those things you have to trade off being able to refresh everything for achieving a, uh, achieving a um, compound radius. Right, now what am I looking for? I'm not sure if the ruler which is going A1. Um, I don't know why it's gone A1 or how A1 or where A1. There it is. I was looking at it side on so it was invisible. Um, in, in situations a number of times in the past where I've refretted um, compound radius guitars, it's been it's, it's entirely possible to do. You just have to make a sequence of slightly different size radius frets. It's a little bit harder. You know, calibrating of your fret bending machine, that sort of thing, and it's. it's sort of not guesswork exactly but you're never working it's never absolutely precise you're, you're always some um, kind of in between a radius but it, it's always it's usually good enough to work and do what you want so getting there it's not far off it'll be a little bit more to do but it will clean up and it's cleaning up very nicely now and we'll get these grey finger marks out and of course the reason why this cut through to the wood and, and the wood has become loaded with finger oil is because it was such a thin finish in the first place um, which is you know a stylistic thing which is cool um, but it, you know it's inevitable that that will be what happens uh, in that situation so we've, got, we've got a little bit of unevenness at the end here so it's, uh, not, it's not sanding through quite as simply as the rest. <laughs> a little depression there showing up. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of you know, aiming to remove a thin finish with sort of slow repetition rather than um, you know, a highly abrasive um, force so that we can hopefully just get it down to the wood in a nice gentle process. Again, concentrating on that grey oiled area with its grind of the finger has uh, sort of built into the wood. We want to clear that up because that's the purpose of doing this. So with this one, um, because it was originally devised as a very thin finish, it's entirely possible to conceive of overspraying this one. Um, now I'm not sure I want to do that, uh, but it's one, you know, it's an approach that you can take. It, it makes it quicker for the finisher person to do. Um, 
my wooden time sort of thinking to himself. Why wouldn't I? First of all, let's see if I can get into this little ditch at the top here first. Almost clean that out so it doesn't look out of place. Okay. So there we have it. A freshened up board tiny little bit of marking still there which I'll make sure that I get rid of. I don't know how well you can see. I think it might be upside down at this point in time but never mind. So again I'm just concentrating on this end here a little bit because this is where the sort of grime was. Um, hopefully that will Clean it all out, get rid of the oil and the grime from the wood, and then we'll be good to put a new coating on. Okay, so yeah, um, what am I saying? What are we talking about? We're talking about, we were saying possibly a nitro. We could spray a nitro over here, there's no reason why not to. Um, we've got lovely gold frets going on. Um, we could, we could spray a, well, the other one we're doing a, an amber poly. We could do a poly here, same way. Spray with some amber, mask it all off. Uh, yeah, with this, yeah. Yeah, clear poly base, or maybe even slightly tinted poly base, followed by some gloss poly overspray. I mean, top coat, mat. That's what I'm trying to get to. So many bloody words to remember, sorry. Um, I don't know how well you can see, but I'm now just digging out the dust from the frets. Uh, yeah, so that's probably what we'll do. And if you remember, this one's gonna be, um, we'll do, yeah, if we do poly, yeah, 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 everything's poly, everything's right. If we do poly, then, when we've fretted, we've done the overhangs on this one, um, then we can fill the ends and touch up with a uh, wipe on poly, hand applied, if we need to just cover the end, uh, you know, the fills over, and then be able to sand that back, tidy that up. So I think that's both guitars are going the poly route. Because um, I think partly because the material on both guitars is poly anyway. Um, but that's looking pretty good. That's going to be a fresh. There's a, there's a tiny little dip here still. Uh, it's not it's not going to really show up. And there's a hint of the original sort of, or the, the, the grime, finger grime in the wood here, which is, of course, I don't want that to take too much out. Um, change the shape any really uh, I think that will be kind of enough and then we'll we'll work with that from there um so yeah so now the thing about poly um, in terms of the spraying conditions is I think we can probably plan to do it tomorrow um the other the important thing about poly is that when you spray poly it is technically um once the water clear dries off evaporates it is it chemically fixed um, and so it's not like uh, not like nitro that you have to wait um, you know a month for it to kind of totally finish okay so yeah so it, what you can see on the edges of here is where the frets popped out the finish before there's a little bit of little split bit of splinter off all around here that I'm going to need to repair or not repair, but fill. And if if I can hopefully um, just fill it and then we'll sand it back and blend it into this poly here as well. What I don't think we need to do is start spraying over there as well. Um, I think we could probably do this by hand. Um, just a little line filling in these little gaps here. This is going to be the, this is going to be the um, hand filled ends. 
So then that means I can touch up these little bits and then we we'll go for a whole sand back and then we go possibly for a final bit of hand applied poly over the top. Um, it's just that's what happened when the frets, uh, the, the board shrunk and the frets popped out the end basically. So that's what you get, these chips of finish that come out. But we'll do the best possible to finish them. I mean, if it was a really bad situation like that, then the option is to um, respray the whole of this um, uh, this section here, the neck, um, or overspray, you know, fill up and sand back. But it's pretty good condition, and, and it's a bit extreme to do all of that when really this is the most, the only you know, bit that really needs doing. So that's the two done tonight. I'll park them up, ready for tomorrow's attention. Um, and oh, those that thing, that GS2 is going to look fantastic with the, the gold piece of it. So I think I'm done for tonight. Thank you for watching. See you in the next bit. God, well, we're lining up to do the refret on the GS2. And I can tell you something. It is boiling in here. So I am losing water through sweat at a phenomenal rate. I put a litre of water up with me a few minutes ago, or arrived a few minutes ago, and it's all gone already, um, nearly all gone. So I cannot stay cool in here. This this roof has been big. Oh shit, man! <laughs> my, uh, my glue's exploding. Wow, that's because that's been roasted all day long. Um, holy cow, that's all over my trousers now. Um, yeah, so it is the hot, hottest day of the year, or something like that. Each one gets hotter, but uh, it is pretty <coughs> darn hot. Uh, so I am roasted in, um, but we've got to carry on. Life must continue. So I have got the GS2. Now this is the GS2 where the back finish came off. Um, in chunks unfortunately so I've been rebuilding it with um, wipe on poly and I haven't finished the job yet so what I'm going to do is refret it now it's looking great on the back by the way and um, feels good and I'm, I'm going to refret it and then I'm going to do the edges or going to do the you know um, any tiny bit of edge beveling when I've done that then I'm going to build up the edges in the gaps where the finish has come out in the past just to sort of balance it out so to begin with I'm just going to, I've got my, I'll just tell you where I'm at. I've got a 12.5 inch radius block here for 12 inch frets. Now the reason I'm using this is it's the only one left and the 12 inch one is a bit better to hell, but it's absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be exact radius. It's just for the purpose of um, fitting in these frets. Now, what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna find me a little pliers because there's a sometimes there's a little twist on these threads that I don't want to get dead right. There's also I want to check something in terms of fret width. Sorry, slot width. Um, just to make sure. I did double check it if, if you remember. Um, but I want to double check to make sure along the way. So I'm just making sure that this little tang edge is nice and smooth, or nice and something straight. So we have we have the refinished neck on the back, which is um, wipe on poly. And on the front here, we've got a mixture of tinted poly went on first, and then some matte poly out of a, a shake, shake and vac can, rattle can later on. So it's got a nice, very uh, soft matte feel to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I remember I've got these hand cut, hand beveled frets. Um, which coming thinking back on it now, given that there's so much, um, so much you know rework I've had to do on the um, what's it? Are we trying to get right to the end? Why are these? Why have I cut? I cut these as undercuts, so we've got end fills to do. Okay, that's right. right. Sorry, I thought we were going flush metal flush to the edge, but I think we're doing that with the other one. Um, so. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put these in and then I'm going to get some wood filler in the end or something like that, or even a yeah, wood filler will do. Um, and then we'll, we'll just make sure that matches 
the colour and we'll then go over that with finish. So this is this is cut to sort of exact size. So it isn't going to be the most precise line because to begin with, I was working very hard to protect the finish. Um, if I'd have known that we would have had the problems, I would have been far less careful um, and I wouldn't have done all that sort of careful hand prepping. Um, I would have pretty much just tapped in the wire and we would have, we would have just um, bevel beveled it with the machine. Okay, 12.5 and I'm just going to tap this home. And this is the this is the first first fret in and so we've got a, a matte finish which we don't want obviously to clag up with um, glue particularly but the nice thing about it being tight bond is that we can clean it off pretty quickly and then we've got the wet cloth here which will allow me to just give it a bit of help so there's the first one going down um whilst i melt so there we go we got we've got a nice sort of clean print bit of glue at the end there. there's a big fly buzzing around this darn place now that that slightly in of the end um and if i were uh, if i were really thinking this i might i might remove this there's something about this one that just feels a little bit short um, which isn't a great thing to re remark on. So that's just just ping that out for a second. Not ideal. Um, I didn't really want to have to do that. There we go. This was feeling a tiny bit, uh, if anything, a tiny bit short. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead. I've got more of this material left, so I'm going to jump ahead two frets. Now, you might think this is a weird thing, but because I've got room now to, or I'm not so frightened of the, uh, what do they call it, the um, dealing with the finish on the edge, because I'm going to rebuild up the edge, I think I'm now going to change my approach right in mid-flow, and I'm going to go for a letting the uh, edge beveling file trim these to length so I'd rather go for a bit longer which means I've jumped forward two frets in the sequence which seems like a bit of an odd thing to do but having done it stay there having done it um, I'm going to run out of frets at the far end but that's okay because I've got some more of this wire spare if you remember and I will just add that in at the end and this gives me a little bit of overhang now which I didn't have before because I cut them perf perfectly flush but this overhang is great because it will allow me to um, let the, the ed edge beveling file do the trimming, um, which I'm actually happier doing now. Uh, possibly, apart from the end two up here where I run out, I'm going to probably just end up hand doing those as well because I don't think I'll get to the get there with the file. So that that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Just looking at where this sits at the moment. I'm just going to give it another tap down. Okay. Right, so two jump, jumping two forwards, probably about right. Um, let's have a go with the next one. So, sorry, it's a bit of a dull uh, camera shot, boring camera shot. I think what I'll do is I'll do three in a row and I'll have a look down the end, see how they're seating, make sure that everything's in order. So, we expect now to be a little bit off the end with every one of these. That's absolutely fine. And there's a little bit of a twist there. I want to be able to feel that little bit of overhang on each one of these, which I can. And that's a little twist there. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, oh, wait a minute, that's saying 16 there, and this is saying 12.5. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. It's not that important. This is just a, a slightly curved block. And that's all it has to be. Yes, so hottest day of the year, absolutely roasting today. Um, I took a, a trip up to see my car, um, collect, collect some stuff. I was on the way to the tip with the Real Love Guitars, bags of refuse, uh, all the sort of empty um, <clears throat> string packets and all the stuff that builds up in the workshop. So I, I tend to store it up in these heavy duty white bags and then I go up to the tip with them every once in a while and cut the cable ties and empty all the stuff into the non-recycling or unrecyclable bin. Um, but when I go up there, I like to take my uh, dad and stepmum's uh, refuse up there as well, stuff that has to go. Yeah, that's sitting on nicely. So with this, it, because of the, the way this is sitting, I'm just having to make sure I'm supporting the neck well at every stage. Um, but that looks good right now. I think it's great big groovy gold evo frets so i'm confident that that's sitting in there quite well and um, so i can feel like uh going a few more at a time now maybe four in a row and i probably uh due to the heat i i'm hoping to get this neck and the cmi neck refretted tonight and um, i've got done a bit of sanding on the this encore body that i'm trying to re finish and redo um and that's a, it's a bit of a kind of, wow, it's a bit of a mess, that body. So I've had to do loads of big fills with JB Weld and stuff like that, which um, amazingly it's sanding out eventually, sort of sanding out s smoothly enough. So quite a lot more to do on that. But I did a bit of that sanding first to get me in the mood for sitting down and fretting. Um, so I'll do this in the CMI tally neck tonight, and then um, we'll leave these dry overnight um, and then tomorrow will be a good time to come and have a go with the end beveling file. Um, if not, I'll just keep these out of the way. Yeah. Um, now some of these, if they don't quite run far enough and undercut, if I'm not comfortable, I'll just take a little bit more off just to make sure it goes far enough. Um, yeah, I had a really nice, um, really nice thing happen yesterday. We went to uh, John, a customer of mine, local to me down here, um, John, who brought me the <sighs> Steinberger, amongst other things, the other day to work on. Uh, we we agreed I would bring the, or well, he invited us over to to the, to his place, um, and I said, well, we'll bring the guitars back. So I brought them back yesterday, and we we were we were a little bit under time pressure but we we went over and uh, had some lunch on the kind of terrace of his place overlooking the river what's it Tamar at Calstock I don't know I guess it is um anyway it was a it was just a fabulous I mean roasting day beautiful views and everything and we just we sat and chatted guitars and life stories and stuff on the on this terrace and while we were there we got got to see um a seal in the in the river and uh, in, a, in a field directly opposite um, John's terrace where uh, we saw a fox come out beautiful condition country fox um, come out from his lair wherever she he or she was maybe bringing up the family and uh, just head out across the field in that unmistakable fox gate that Fox Gate sounds like a political scandal, but um, yeah, you know what I mean. The way Fox walks with his tail out straight and stuff. It's just amazing to to be sat there and see such such wildlife. Um, and then there were people on the river with their paddle boards and canoes and stuff. It looked idyllic, really. Um, and you know, on a roasting hot day. So I just thought, you know, felt very privileged to you know, to be able to 
meet, meet good people and um, you know be taking back uh, oops now this one I've, I've under hung this one come on now gently out you come come on I need to go a little bit along come on thank you thank you Yeah, so yes, yes, but just to, you know, I couldn't help thinking, can't get much better than this type of thoughts. Um, so this one, this is a, this, this guitar had me so um, freaked out for a bit. You know that that there's there's nothing worse as a guitar tech. There is absolutely nothing worse than than when you um. It's got a little chip on the side of it. It's not going to be in play, but it's one of those frets that the the um, thing has bought it. It's just a visual thing. The top of it will be you know trouble free. Um, it'll be smoothed out. But yeah, so it's a uh, it, this this guitar was one of those. It occasionally happens that you start off with something and then before you know it something's you know the finishes come off the fingerboard and in this case it, it was the back because because the fingerboard it took the finish off deliberately but um I've, I've had it a few times before with um with i think the american fenders there's a certain era uh, of, of american maple boarded fender strats and i think strats mainly that i've seen personally but it's as if the something about the way they were sprayed maybe just didn't get adhesion between the the kind of um the clear finish and the wood now you know I, i'm not claiming ex, extra expertise on this and otherwise i i've done the best i can to get respray you know refinish this uh this uh fingerboard with a poly finish um and i you know i i'm pretty confident uh, that it will stay on and also the finish that I've put on by hand on the back to build it up from where the finish just it flaked and came out in a great big sort of round patch almost like a uh, it had the texture of that sort of uh, you know stunt stunt cowboy stunt glass you know and in the sort of the sugar paper sugar bottle things you know that they bash on people's heads in the films and um so yeah it's got it's got that sort of texture to it um but the the stuff i've refinished it with is uh wipe on poly which i've used tons of times before and it's really really solid and strong and i've you know i've done it loads of times straight on bare wood and it's been absolutely fine so i'm you know pretty confident that that will uh, it will be good and in fact the bit where the wipe on poly touches the wood is probably going to be better than the rest of the, the neck which still has the original finish on it so there was a part of me I thought when, when I was taking off the all the um the masking that I put on the body I actually thought to myself if any of this comes off then this this really deserves to be stripped off and done again all the clear coat done again but as it happened the, uh, the clear coat on the body behaved differently um, and, and didn't come off or didn't provide you know present any problems which i'm pleased to say um but you know it has left me in a sort of position where there is um obviously some wipe on poly that goes right through to the wood and then there's obviously some original poly which is going to be as susceptible to potentially susceptible to flaking as anything else or as the first lot so what i'm i'm trying to do is as i finish all of this off i'm basically going over the whole uh, back of the neck so that the wipe on poly actually gets to cover over uh, the original to some degree and to sort of i don't know cocoon it i suppose just that you know to try and prevent any more of it coming off because the uh, the thing I've also got to do here is in in leveling these got to level these frets um, and in leveling frets you you absolutely have to 
have <laughs> the ability to um, mask off the frets, uh, mask off, yeah, mask off the fingerboard with with um, masking tape. And you know, you, you, even the the lightest, lowest tack masking tape in the world, sometimes if the finish is determined to come off, like I suspect this stuff, original Gordon Smith stuff might be, um, then it, it almost doesn't matter what grade um, low tack you use, it still there's still a risk of all that finish just deciding to fall right off. So I'm doing going to be doing my utmost to add a bit of strength by putting this finish on top. Um, These have sat, so far have sat in very well. This is, this will make a very different feel. This the the kind of change in the fret scale here, or from scale the fret gauge is is going to make a very different feel, um, which I think Rob's going to have to relearn. It's a it's a different beast. Um, so a quick look down here. That's ah, looking pretty good. Just check the edge of this one. Sometimes you get just one that seems to stick up. There you go. Look at that. Just squelched out a little bit there. Don't ask me why it stayed up higher than the others, but it did, just a fraction. Now, truth is, levelling would have taken care of that, um, but it's nice to, it's easier or better to get it kind of tapped in. If there's a little bit standing out proud, get it tapped down <clears throat> before anything, you go any further. Okay, let's, um, now let's have a look. We, in terms of the support now, I can bring this up a little bit closer. And that, that's going to be fine. We'll get up to there and then we'll put it on its edge. And I've taken the, I've taken the uh, strap button out of there already. Um, so we won't have it in the way. It'll, we can rest it on its finish, if you like. Okay. So once this is in, as I say, I'll leave this overnight and we'll be coming back to it tomorrow in the even hotter day, um, probably tomorrow. Well, I say tomorrow, I'm thinking tomorrow evening, but I'm hoping that if my, I've got this egg, uh, Encore body that I need to spray and I'm going to only have a few days this week where it's the, the temperatures and the humidity are right. I mean, it's a good spraying temperatures at the moment we've got we're getting down into the 40s during the middle of the day humidity terms and um, you know nice high temperatures so all of it kind of conducive to uh, The legendary GS2. Now, this is an interesting beastie in so far as that it has 
been challenging. So we're going to need to string it up. String it up. And here are some, some screws for this scratch plate. So we're going to need to string this together. And the reason for that is, if I can see what I'm doing, yes, um, we have refreshed it, but we've also had to rebuild the finish on the back and the sides because it came off. Now that's done and what I need to do now is refit the tuners um, so we can string it up and so that we can uh, what else do we need to do? String it up and oh yes fret level it. It's going to need that and this is going to be the interesting bit because it's when we come to level the frets and put on the uh, um, I'm going to have to use masking tape to protect the finish. That's when we're going to discover whether all of the rest of this finish on the neck is going to decide to come off. And I'm really not looking forward to that at all. Um, but that's the risk we're going to have to take with this because there's no ways around it. Now the other thing we have to do here is to fit this new nut. I've got to get the adjustable nut. Now I might leave that to afterwards. I might just use the existing brass nut um, for now. Um, and that would help me on my way. And then we could do the nut as the last thing. Or is it does that make any sense? Thinks to self. Probably not. Um, we've got to basically make a copy of the uh, Gordon Smith nut, um, which I've got some tusk uh, saddle material here, which I'm going to, I had a plan to use, that was my plan. So we've got the brass nut here to copy. So that was going to be a matter of um, seeing how well we can do. to do up the last bit with hand by hand. So it would be interesting to see if we can get an exact copy of this nut. Um, I sort of thought of doing it because uh, tuning is my number one uh, pursuit. wanted to be absolutely sure that we got this to stay in tune. Well, um, brass is a kind of cool looking material. It, it isn't the easiest to work with, and especially if you need to make any adjustments to your slots. It's a kind of an impossibility, really. Um, people do, and I guess certain luthiers might want to spend their days um, adjusting uh, brass slots, but I don't, because I don't, <laughs> don't find it cares too well for my tools, and I don't find it cares too well for the um, ease, friction-free slots in the end. So, as you know, I think Tusk is the best stuff around, and I will be sort of fighting... Wow, that is one squeaky neck. That's, that just shows how, um, what the word is, how, what's the word I'm looking for? How, shows how glossy that is. Now, I'm going to put this uh, on last. What I really need to do is to get the, get the bridge and the stop bar on, because that's what's going to allow me to, um, allow me to if I can get this off that's what's going to allow me to level the frets and that's pretty important so if I can just pull off this paper which is mostly stuck to itself or to the cloth there you go that's that we can worry about disconnecting all of that later on um, so it's got some 
could do with a good clean up but I'll do that afterwards. So if I just for now attach, fix the bridge and the stop bar device, a very cool stop bar. So we're going to need some, we're going to need some, what are we going to do? That is almost identical in terms of size. I've already drawn the shape of it on. I think I've drawn, have I drawn the shape of it? No, I've drawn something else on there. Let's have a look. There we are. So let's bring something up against this to keep it flat. Hmm. It's kind of difficult to keep it flat. It doesn't want to stay where I want to put it. That gives me a pretty good impression. Now if I go and cut this, then the next challenge is going to be to cut these little slots and cross the slots. The idea of the slots is to allow you to sort of raise it or lower it to wherever you feel so inclined. But the other thing is I'm going to need to repli replicate, replicate the spacing. So I have to figure out, find a place where I can match up the spacing. This ruler keeps getting bent. Close, but not close enough. Right. Too far apart, too close, too far apart. Too close. One, two, three. Too close together. Pretty much. Pretty much there. Probably a bit too far. Is too big. I'm going the wrong way, I oh. that's about right, nearly. It's above the B, it's above the B, it's above the B, it's this one here. I know what, sorry about this, I know what my start point is, so if I put a little bit of green tape. This is just for when I shape this marvellous device. I'm going to want to know where exactly where it needs to sit. So... There and there. So start between those two. Sorry. Start between those two. Yeah. Great. That's the first thing. Okay. <coughs> so goes along to the device over there. Now. This doesn't accommodate the slots, but we'll do those by hand separately. So just for now, I'm going over to the noisy thing, and I'm going to cut out these, cut out this piece of tusk material using the saw.
now we have one ugly ass thing. Well, it is ugly for a minute, that's all I can say. Hey, you can see. Right, so the point there being is, so to speak, is this is duply replicating this thing. So I could, technically, if I can get a, an angle on this, which I can't, I'd have to look at this from a different angle. Can't do this there. Sorry about the picture for a minute. Go to a different place. <laughs> this is actually <laughs> quite difficult to hold. cool is that? <laughs> I feel so clever in my own sort of way. Uh, <laughs> can I see the other hole? Yes, I think I can. Probably needs a tiny bit of widening, but I'm not going to fret too much about that right now. Oh. Would you look at that? Fly you around. Fly you to the moon. Da, 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 da. Right. So, there we have a dummy thingy thingy. Then we can do some fun stuff. Because now we can do something like this. Now, that is a way of, just for now, cleaning it up. And eventually, once I've cleaned this back smooth, obviously avoiding all the finish, God help us, um, obviously I can draw the marks I want on it, um, which I'm obviously not quite there yet. So I want to keep on, whoops, keep on keeping on sanding backwards, get a bit of a backwards slope on it. Now this kind of nut will be, um, I will first of all cut the slots to height, to, to the right height relative to each other by using my famous <laughs> V-notch file. And then what I'll do is I'll widen the holes afterwards so that we can lift it up or put it down if we want to. Yes, that's right. Now, here's the another tricky bit. So we've got to establish our um, our outside marks. I'm going to the center of the earth. Center of each one. Silly me, I have hidden the darned Start point. <laughs> right, I'll get rid of that now. There's my start point and there's my end point. Very good. There's my marks. On your marks. Get set. Go. Now, this is a tricky bit. Getting these to cut in a straight line of any kind is always difficult. So I'm gonna use, oh Christ, I'm not gonna use it if I get it stuck on the magnet. I'm gonna use this 10 millimeter file to cut the first one. One. Two. Four. 
day. Six. Just double check. Yes. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, I can't really make much sense of this now until I've strung up the guitar, which I'll do with some uh, nines from the, the land of Harley Benton again. Only because they're convenient throwaway strings. No offence, Mr. Harley and Mrs. Benton. But well, that, was a, that was a quick way of making that nut, wasn't it? A lot less trouble than I at first thought. Now, this isn't a very... Uh, the, the notch is obviously the wrong size for all these strings at the moment. So what I first will do is... Oops. Put this on. Pull it forward. Run it through here. If I can keep it on. Uh, string winder. Yeah, so like I said, my big holding breath moment at this point in time is whether or not this is going to work as a um, uh, whether the finish is going to stay on board this thing or whether it's all going to come flying off I'm going to attach this one first and then lightly stop it on its slot, which is obviously the currently the wrong shape slot for this. And we'll see how they stack up across the way. Now it may be this this one was quite close to the edge on the brass one, so I'm kind of following that, but it may be that really it needs to be slightly to one side. Uh, but I think it's about as good as it can be at the moment. So I've just um, lowered the action at the bridge as much as I can to ensure that it's somewhere in the region of where I want it to be before we tighten anything up. Of course, the idea now will be to cut this down um, until we're in the right place. The other thing I just want to do is, while I'm here, is just make sure this is tightened up. Now, the brass obviously holds the pull of the those things, screws, <coughs> pretty well. And I'm going to now find out whether the tusk does the same or not. And if it doesn't, we can always revert to the brass. That's absolutely fine. This is a, an a experiment to make, take a good guitar and make it better. Trying. So after all of that, like I said, my, my concern right now then is that I can do the fret levelling and the, the blessed finish all stays on the guitar. That's my number one finger crossed, fingers crossed. Or it'll be fine. I've got a fair amount of faith in that wonderful wipe on poly stuff that I've used many times before. Uh, it's, it's always been very robust. Now, I've said on this already, I can't say whether um, that means, I can't really say whether the um, The stuff underneath is going to give up the ghost or decide now is the time to conk out because it might well do that. In which case, the good stuff on top is going to come off with the crap stuff underneath. But, you know, you can only do so what you can do, so I'll do my best. Um, I do know, obviously, that if it does all decide to flake off, um, we've got the ability to put it all on again. Uh, the worst comes to the worst, but obviously. Could all, we could all do without that.
I think you know people will have different views about the um, the way finish adheres to wood, but to have finish that can't withstand these pretty standard um, masking tape cover up is a bit on the wimpy side. You wouldn't have anybody in the luthier videos shying away from that. They would expect to be able to do that type of work on it, without a doubt. I think the difference between a lot of their videos and mine is that bet you there theirs wouldn't see the light of day if that happened that would be the video put in the bin okay let's have a look are we all right No notches. I forgot that as well. Strings on. Okay. Everything's looking just about right. So what we want to do, put a little bit of tension on them, but not much. And the aim, aim of the game now is to take these down to the correct height, or the target height. Now, we can either use um, these fa fabulous oh, Christ <laughs> this um, this is not a good idea right I can either use these Hosco files which I acquired part exchange off um, JT I believe it was or I can do a combination of things um, and use a bit of the old V notch files as well but one of the things that's difficult in digging down quite a long way is is a great risk of losing your slot so it goes off sideways so let's have a look and see how these work shall we these hosco chappies let's have a look uh, let's have a close up ish shall we have a close up should we see if we can have a close up hey woo is that too scary yeah right let's go with there so uh, we're going to go from the G outwards. And what's the G, ladies and gentlemen? It's sort of roughly the 17. So if I start with this and I get my... We'll go with the cautionary 40, okay, as our start point. Let's go with the G and let's cut down where the G says. These have been a little bit bent somewhere along the line. Don't know quite what's happened to these, whether it's happened in transit in the post or something, but they appear to have bent a li little. They're actually... Actually, um, a bigger gauge, I think, than you would expect. 17. We're looking at 10, 13, 17. It's a bit high. So at this point, you might want to switch over to either the uh, V file, or the V file will widen it out and clear some material either side, which makes it easier to use. Um, but the V, v file have to be careful so it doesn't run off in the sideways direction so I'm going to go with this oh and if you also want to widen it get in there with your circular uh, file as well because that will clear the edges and give you a little bit more room to get into where you want to be 
So, we go 17 again down here. Now this is um, cuts very differently for, from other things I've used before, so I have to be very careful not to let it run away with. Just on 40 there. So I will stop there before I get into trouble. We can go down a little further later on, but well, I'm just making this up. I don't know that's in tune at all. Okay, so now we'll go with the, um, the 13, and we'll look at the spacing. It looks pretty good. We'll aim to cut this straight down as clear as possible. <sighs> pretty effective cutters, I have to say. Um, let's see what happens if we go all the way down on one file. <sighs> wow, close. I think I'll stop right there. Nah, it's the first time I've used them in anger, shall we say, this way. Let's try the 10. Again, spacing's good on the 10, so let's just run that down. cutting power these things. Okay, so we're getting close. Uh, and it doesn't mind the um, the depth of the cut because it's got a sort of um, a bit of a notch to it which opens up the, the slot above um, the thing we're doing currently. So there's th these are now down to the right heights and like I say I can if I want to sort of create more room, I can use this device here to uh, just open up the space because we're going to get rid of this uh, extra room. So I don't want all of this extra material. Oops, fall off sideways. Don't want all this extra material sitting here. So I can sort of clear a bit of it out. And what I'll end up doing is I'll end up when the um, once I've got close, I'll end up taking all the uh, excess material off and then we'll come down in a controlled way, probably with the V-notch pile. Okay, so now we're on the fourth, so it's back to the red one, and we're on 26. So here we go. Now this one is in the right place, feels good. The next one may need a bit of realignment. So I'm, I'm running the 26 edge here, that should be fine. Pressing backwards, whoops, just on the mark, I would say. Whoops, <laughs> that's amazing how I managed to stop right on the dot. Okay, now this one feels to me like, where is it? Actually, that one's in the right place, but the, the low E is a fraction off. So what I'm going to do with the low E is I'm going to just soften out this thing with a, this thingy here that thing and I'm going to give the file another chance to cut a different groove probably slightly closer okay so now we're on the, um, the 36 and it's in the right place so we'll run the 36 edge here I think the thing I have to learn to be careful with with this file is probably a lot quicker than I think so what I'll do is I'll just put these approximately into tune um, only because it's nice to know nice to know the tension. Okay, they're looking good. Very good. Check this one. For height, a bit more, but not much. Uh, 36, 13 and 36, right? Final one is 46, 36 and 46, okay. Mm. 
Now this one, because it's got a slight bend in it, this one slightly wants to create a bit of trouble and kick up. So I've got to be careful. Stop right there. Now, this one, it needs to be right in the middle of that slot. So let's go 46. And let's see if we can keep it on target a bit better. Now if we get it wrong, then there's still a chance to recover. Now that's good. That's very good. Terrific. Okay, a little bit more. <sighs> Close too. So um, that's fairly high at this end. This was just guessed at the other end, by the way. Guessed? I was just guessing. I'm going to do it down a little bit. You want the action to be right when we come to uh, adjust or do the fret leveling. Now the problem we've got at the other end is we've got, um, and, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take away some of this excess material. But at the other end we've got a problem of the um, having no, uh, no notches on the saddles, uh, the bridge saddles. So that's a bit of a problem that we're going to have to deal with. Now this, obviously, you can tell I'm having, I'm having to, I'm now lowering the bridge, uh, the nut, quite a lot at this end on the treble side because it's quite a lot too high. But it will eventually shave off all the excess material and we'll be down to a, a much smoother looking nut at the end of it all. And then we can tidy that up once the, um, once we've taken strings off again. Of course I don't mind, because they're sacrificial strings, I don't mind running the risk of um, shaving them with this sandpaper. Okay, so there'll be a little bit of, a little bit more flattening out to do. Do it enough eventually it'll probably just shred the, sh the string and break <laughs> but that's starting to now get to a nice little shape and we'll get it even closer and that's got a little bit of trimming to do at the end here as well um, and the other end's fine so we'll just round it off so it's kind of round at both ends um, look at that plays already now what i'm going to do is i'm going to now just do a quick zoom out, something like that. What I want to do is check the playing action at the other end as well as I can. And now we're getting close at one end. Let's check it at this end. Um, and we want our standard target action of 1.5. Well, that's a fraction over, but only just 1.5. And on this end, we want about 1.2. That's currently a little bit too much. Here we go. Now we'll tune it again and have a feel. Right, now, the bit that concerns me is the spacing on here. It's a little bit off, I have to say. I'm at a loss as how to cure it. Um, hmm. I need notches 
We could try and do it with the same POSCO files, but it's about getting the position right. Uh, the way these strings, sorry, you can't see very well, but the way these strings are sitting right now is a sort of natural place they sit. And I don't really know how I'm going to marker this off without some sort of tape that I can cut and fix. Let's see if I can do something with it. So I need a thin piece of marker. And I would put it down on there. Well, that's very, very hard to make it stay anywhere. So the idea, there might be a better way to do this than I currently don't know it. The idea is to bring that to I'm just I'm just giving a sort of delineating the gap where I think it should go and then I technically should be able to remove that to there. And that's my marker. <laughs> Let's have a look up close and see what we can see. Now obviously um you either had no you have no um notches or some notches and this doesn't have any and as a result I've noticed that when you bend these sk skate across the top there so you can see my little marked out place that's where the string lives and it's not dead center of the because um, these these tend to move as we get over to this side these are moving slightly to the side now my thought would be let us now put a very tiny notch on here with the finest one of these and that's the 10 okay and it is literally notching on the top like this there is the notch Doink. and there is it sitting in the notch right. and then we remove these things now the other thing is we have to obviously do the minimum amount of notching so we don't get a completely bizarre weird and wonderful uh, what the, the word I'm looking for is radius but that's fine so they're all sitting where they should do right at this moment but it means I've got to make lots of little strips so I'm going to notch a piece for each one of these sizes using the Hosco thingies um, so I'm going to cut lots of little do what you're told will you lots of little strips I think the idea <laughs> if I can even see what I'm doing and then I will use those to mark out each one as I go and I will just have to guess the amount of notching and go only as far as is required to make an impression given that I'm happy with where these things currently stand so that one goes on there and pressing that down on there there's my mark who would have thought that, eh? So it's just a little detail of something that is overlooked, I'm afraid. It's, I mean, maybe that's deliberate. Maybe some people think that's the way it should be. But I have to say, if you've got a string that's going sliding off sideways because there's no notch, it doesn't work as well as it should. So we're going to go 13 on this one. I didn't really like the fact that it moved last time. How are you doing? Uh, let's zoom in on there. There we are. <sighs> Small notch. And again, these notches will need to be, once I've taken the strings off, I'll need to sand these, smooth them out. Okay, that's good. Principle is working. Now, having marked them all out, or when, when I've marked them all out, if I need to make any slight adjustments, so for example, if I think one is fractionally lower than the others, I would have to take the others down to match it, for example. But I don't think we're in that sort of place, really. I think it's going to just work just fine. So this one, I'm just going to move slightly to one side, because I've gone too close to the edge. There we have it. And this is a very crude way of doing it, but funnily enough, at least it lets me see. It's moved off to one side, but I can still see. Um, yeah, 
10, 13, 17, okay, 17, here we go, get the right way up, 17 down, 17 down, notching on the top. Probably um, start with a small one, but I don't want to end up using lots of cuts, I'd rather just make one notch and live with it. I think you'll find it's fine. Yes. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, you probably find that it's not such a problem on the lower strings because you're not likely if people are likely to bend them less. Um, but I think it's nice to have it in principle. Probably some better substance I could use for this than what I'm doing currently, but. Okay, so we go from uh, 10 to 26, 26. Now this is a bit difficult because the string is actually moving the paper. So now we're going to go 26. Now it doesn't want to play, but that will do. So I'm resisting a bit now because it's a thicker cut or a potentially deeper slot, bigger slot. That's good. On target. So far, so good. for the uh, 36. Thirty-six down thirty-six. Thank you. New. Hey, hey, hey. Now this one, what's it trying to do? Kind of, it really wants to sit there, but it's off target at the moment. So I'm going to put it where it should be, not where it's currently sitting. Because it's not in the right place. It's gone into a bit of a notch that isn't the right notch, if you follow me. Okay. Well, this is a good example of figuring out how to solve something on the fly because I didn't really know how I was going to work this one out. Okay, and 46 finally, here we go. 46 down, 46 down. Uh, let's hold both ends of this to keep it in a straight line if we can. Jolly good. Jolly good. Right, that's the stage. Once we've got everything done in fret leveling department, we'll take care of the um, we'll take care of the notch smoothness afterwards. So there we have notches. Now we have nut pretty much at the right height at this end. Um, what I'll do is I will see us something. Let's just see while we're here. <laughs> Let's take these off a minute. Okay, so I'm going to, while I'm at it, I'm going to take these down. I'm going to round off the edges a little bit and slope this backwards. well so 
I'm kind of carefully making sure that we're as nice and smooth as possible. I've got the slots still there, but nothing is going to be um, a problem. So we have a little tiny adjustment still to do on these, and I might just do it like this, a little bit of back tidying. And this is making sure that it's nice and free moving, but it's not anywhere near the front edge, so that hasn't changed. Okay, um, now while we're at it, we've got different grades of things, so let's get a bit of, let's get a bit of this out and just sand this a little bit with this grade. it with an even finer grade. You can hear it whistling. do at this point is put that back in there like this, go back up to pitch and we'll just get the fine tuning of the action just to get it exactly right while we've got the sacrificial strings on. Okay, and then I would get my 13 mil, 30.3, which is my bottom line target, and start from the G, and I would make the adjustment now with this file, probably. Oh, we could try it with the other ones. Come on, we're in for a penny, in for a pound with these. <sighs> Just on the mark. Ooh. I'm using the 20 wrong size, aren't I? No, that's 26. That should be the 17. Oh, that's why. Egypt. See, I got caught out now. That's the 13 now. Just on the mark. Ten down. Ten is down. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now, uh, this one will be twenty six, won't it? on the mark. Don't touch it. Don't touch that one. Let's go with the low E. There's a little bit more to do. 46 down. 46 down. Go for a tune up again. Oi!
sharpened edge there to take care of. So now the question is, what plays and what doesn't? So this is the pre-leveling check. Pretty good. too bad so um difficult bit now is to here we go once more strings off frets covered in marker pen okay <laughs> now here you have to be extremely careful with the pen and the fingerboard because the two don't mix very well. Now later on when I come to do the polishing I will mask the fingerboard off. Um, but it's just the order I do it in really. The I suppose I I, I guess I could have masked it off first but you may have guessed by now that the longer I can keep any masking tape off the back of this neck, the happier I'm going to be. That's my thinking about it. So I'm trying to avoid that at all costs. Now the great thing about, of course, this nut is if I wanted to, I could now raise it up a little bit. I guess you'd have to put a little shim under each end, only a tiny little thing. Do it up and then it would sit a little bit higher, which would be quite cool. sitting in the right place, that's why. Okay, so this is going to be the fun part, the fret levelling. I may just start this tonight and I may put the rest off to tomorrow, but here is the start point. We know already we've got uh, uneven frets. The question is where and how many and how easy are we going to get free of those frets. Now this is where the fingerboard can get dirty as well so we have to be careful to blow or brush the, um, any dirt off it. Now this is interesting that even on just loose that shows we've got a very flat neck at the moment so that's ready to go even at that setting so here we go I'm expecting to find some pretty t tall frets on this down here the second fret is a little high and then we're going to find some right at the top here seeing what we've got. We may have some low frets getting in the way, it's often the case. Well, that plays. 
So I'm going to stop on that one right there. Let's move on because we're going to hit problems on the other tracks. I know that much. Um, very, um, th this method is very telling. It shows you what's going on and what you're hitting quite quickly. These are big frets, so that they're, we're expecting to um, level down. Now I don't know if we've got a low, really low fret here, but that one is going to be problematic up here. The problem with a low fret is it makes the next one high, so you have no choice but to um, bottom out the low fret, otherwise you'll, you'll find the, high, or the relatively high fret choking it out. So we don't really have much choice, we've got to work it quite hard. So it's a funny shaped neck on here. It's not quite right. That's where it thickens up. But it's not. Oh, mind you, let me just check the height of this because this, look, this is looking. Oh, holy, holy cactus! Well, that doesn't help, does it? <laughs> I am I'm somewhat too low. Hmm. Okay, let's get this back to where it should be. One point two. One point two. Better. Mm -hmm. These things are always uneven. The um, what do you want to call them? The tunematic bridges. Okay. Yeah, I think that will need a little bit of extra work, but hey. Tiny bit more on that one, and we should move on. Recalibrate. Um, at this point, it makes sense to get a cloth and keep your hands clean. So, quick wash and a wet cloth. So I'm going to recalibrate. A bit more curvature needed. Okay. So a little bit more tweaking on those um, saddles a, a little bit later on.
got some low one there. That's really puzzling. Something, something, um, I don't know what the word would be. Something un... It's, it's doing, I think it's doing a very Les Paul thing, this neck. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to run across the whole lot and then I'm going to go back to concentrate on that top end where we've got a little bit of wrinkle going on. don't know why, but... Odd. Now this this is one that I, I mean, I think I might have said right back at the beginning during the refretting, is that because I was wasn't sure about, couldn't really confirm what the actual radius was on this, and it was it was looking like it was a compound radius 12 to 14, um, but if if I had to do it again, um, I would err on the side of re-radiusing this rather than working with whatever is going on because there's some unevenness in this uh, neck that I it would have been better to have levelled out, or not levelled out, but sand, you know, um, re-radiused out as it is. I'm sort of having to cope with it now. Come back to that one, that's a low fret there. Next one. So I know where the low fret is. So I'm now kind of keeping my eye, whoops, that's not the way to do it. Keeping my eye on it. And if it really doesn't do anything, then I'll, we'll have to look at potential pulling it and um, if, if absolutely necessary, pulling it and refitting it. Um, ideally, wouldn't really want to do it, but very occasionally I've had to. Um, if it's the only one, you know, stopping the party, uh, as it were, and it's worth doing. <laughs> So if it is what I think it is, as in a, a plateau that's getting in the way up there, I think then we're going to have to um, carefully calibrate the neck and try and let it do its own thing under gravity with the fret levelling beam. Um, that's all we can do really. And if, if it doesn't work after a couple of gentle passes of that, then we'll be into considering do we refret it or not just that one because it's it's funny how it turns out One low fret. See if we can get it out one more time. We'll go over them all. If it don't come out on this time round, then we'll reconsider. So this time I really want to get the shape, make sure the shape is exactly right, which it is. And then we want to get in there. <coughs> And really, 
suppose I'm going to just concentrate on this end and just steer the other end a little bit. And it, you can tell the one that isn't getting any, um, there's, there's a couple of frets in here that just aren't getting any treatment basically and that's the ones that are coming up as flat, uh, sorry, too low. And I'm just trying to work on the ones around it so we get to a, a, a spot where it's just about cleared away so it will play. Okay, that plays. Do the same thing on this one. Problem is, you see, is if you get one that's low and the others behave relatively high around it as a result, then what happens is it, it shows up as relatively high when you bend strings as well and, and it will choke off the string, which is a bummer if everything else works. Going off into the G track, I'll try one more calibration on the G. Getting there. I mean, the alternative is we raise the action a little bit, but um, I, I like to get it done in the land of the frets first before having to resort to raising the action.
double check. Okay, that one's got to come down a little bit in there. That strange little thing. Let's go for the right one. Let's go for the right one. 13, 10, 10, 10, 10 down, 26, 10 down, 10 away from me. Right, so it's 1 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6. So that would normally be higher. Mm -hmm. Oh, most there. Tiniest bit more, and then I'm switching over into finishing for tonight mode. gentlemen I will need to clean polish the slots out there need to mask off the fingerboard and I think the slots up here are just spot on so I'm not going to do anything to those other than round off the edge of the fingerboard no the nut um, but I think I've probably reached the end of today's session um, that's one bit taken care of um, a little bit more work than I would have liked um, due to one uneven fret. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I do like to, wherever possible, re-radius the fretboard because I have no idea what the, why or what kind of a little dip any particular fret sits in. And I don't, you know, it's not, it's not under my control from the outset. So, um, prefer to have the control to radius it but for that it would have had to not been a, a compound radius so that's 
just how it goes. Um, I'll just wipe this clean for a minute. So the next thing, I'm not going to do it tonight, but the next thing tomorrow is I will ma uh, cover all of this off um, with masking tape and in one fell swoop I shall whiz through uh, and make sure that it's, um, it's polished out with no problems at all. Now, just a little thing here. If you want to take care of a little bit of sticking out. Oh my god, this is, this is where I could run into all kinds of problems. A little bit of sticking out nut. This is typically how you do it. But I suddenly realised that oh, we could be into a storm of problems. And what I like to do is to get, uh, well, normally, get a particular, not that one then, not that one, get a particular thing and uh, basically take it down. But I normally have one with a thin end on it that I can use like this. quite good because it sort of shows you very quickly when you're getting down to the level of the fingerboard and then you can sort of round it off and then you can stop at the point where you can't go any further. Did that come up? No, that's how it's sitting. Okay. And then I think on this what you also might do is just go around the front a little bit where it could be uh, sharp. Just to make it less so, as Patrick Stewart might say. Make it less so. Okay, there's those bits, there's that bit, and there's this bit. All those bits go away. Um, I think what I'll do is while I'm still got my brain in gear, I will get the smallest of these, the 10, and I'll get some 400 grit paper if I can find some. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, got a bit of 400 grit paper, of which I'm nearly out of, and I will. Let's give these little slots a little sand out. I'll just do it this way, sorry if you can't see it. This is um, not a very good way of doing it. Sticking where? Got some dents in it or something. What's this being used for, eh? It's ten. Getting it smoothed out so that it doesn't run the risk of cutting the strings in any way. Unlikely that it would, but it's nice to make sure. Okay. Now, I just know that as soon as I touch there, it's going to reset the height of the bridge. But say la vie. there that one's there that one's that way right okay so tomorrow will be the big day I shall put that on there because what I've got to do before I mask it off particularly uh, is I'll just need to recrown this now I'm going to use my jumbo side of the stumac crowning file and once I've done that 
then I'll stop and tomorrow we'll do the deadly test with the masking tape. Oh God, I'm scared. So let's, let's do this bit first before we go. We nearly time to go. All right, are you watching? Are you looking? Oh, it's doing that thing again. What's it saying? Low battery. Yeah, the clothes, man. Thank you. All right, I'm going to have to go. We're back tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, battery. Okay, it's uh, it's that day. The day has finally arrived. The Gordon Smith has uh, reborn and ready to go. Whew. So this is this has been quite a quite a challenge, as you probably already know. Um, so I was pleased to say that I was able to re, I don't know, do the frets and all of that stuff without the, um, without the, without any further damage to the finish. Uh, very, very cautious, very nervous, but it paid off and we got there. So, whew, you know, a long <laughs> roundabout trip. Um, it's just one of those things that happens, unfortunately. And you can't predict, or you can't, you don't know how somebody else's finish has gone on, or what condition it is, or what quality it is, and so on. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite a challenge. So I'm just going to put the second string on first. I don't know why, I just feel like doing that that way around. Um, and I'll move the thing up the scent in a minute. <sighs> yeah, so this has been, this has been, as you know, a fair old hassle um, just it's one of those jobs that you get presented with a challenge and you just go with it and you go with it and then you kind of get another challenge and you go with that and you get another challenge and you keep on going uh, you know and actually to be honest there was a point in this that I was quite prepared to um, quite prepared to you know re-finish re everything if it if if it was necessary it's just one of those things if it's not going to work it's not going to work and there's nothing you can really do about it no matter how much you wish there was um, I'm just pulling the action up now I've lost the action because I've cleaned up the body and moved the saddle around and stuff the bridge around anyway so we're going to get it wired up now to Dario 9s we've got the tusk adjustable no sorry it's not adjustable it, well it is adjustable it's adjustable courtesy of the Gordon Smith system which actually kind of looking at it now thinking that might be quite a good idea to copy and I think what they did very cleverly is they gave themselves an adjustable type nut for minimal hassle and I think that was a, a clever trick um, and so the way it works going up sorry about that going up um, or down at the moment this is sitting flat I've, I've just prepared it sitting on its haunches I didn't want any sort of risk of it squatting down later on when I wasn't expecting it. Um, but you could technically uh, move it up and down to wherever you want it. Um, so that's its, that's the sort of the essence of its adjustability. But it's a clever idea, or a good idea, and it's simple. And also it means that you're fixing it to the top end of the, uh, the guitar uh, fingerboard rather than sort of cutting down or gluing uh, into onto gluing to the shelf and running the risk of all those hassles that come with too much glue or finish that uh, won't let, let the nut go and things you've seen in the past so it's a it's a much it's a nifty solution of course it also makes it easier for them to fit one in brass and kind of move it around quite simply if necessary um, the reason I ch the only reason I changed it is because first of all it's not going to make any different it's not going to change the uh, what's the word it's not ch it's not doing anything permanent modification to the guitar so um, Rob can always put the brass one back on if he was ever going to sell it or preferred the brass one um, so this one you know as with all nuts of tusk um, I put it on because I'm keen for uh, Rob to have the best tuning stability possible which 
um, which I find is very much helped by the tusk. Anyway, so we shall see if, uh, if it works for him. And if not, he can revert to the original brass nut without any adjustments necessary. Just take off the tusk, put on the, put on the brass. Um, I just took another photograph of the inside of this, uh, these pickup routes, and they are pretty shocking for a handmade British guitar. I mean, I would I would be a bit embarrassed if I left the uh, the routes of the guitar I made looking like that. I mean, occasionally you know things happen, and you you know you, you can sort of argue, well, it's hidden. What the, you know what what the eye don't see, the chicken don't something or other. But you know, it's not really not quite really what you want to be known for or remembered for, I would say. So, surprising. And there's a couple of other little things, um, like one of the pickups, the, maybe more than one, but the neck pickup, um, the fitting screw that they've fitted has stripped out the hole in the pickup, uh, the little pickup tab, and that means that they've had to and sort of put a little screw, a little nut on the end uh, to sort of hold it in place. But as soon as that gets too low and drops off, um, then uh, well, you know you, you have to go in and solder that little nut on if you really want it to work, because basically you're boost you're boosting the um, the metal which has given way, or you strip the metal, the soft metal of the pickup lug. Anyway, just not great, you know. I mean, it's a it's a I think what they've done, um, and maybe the person, maybe they, I don't know if the Gordon Smith came with these, but maybe they did. Um, they've they've kind of trimmed the tabs. That's okay. I often do that, um, but then they've they've kind of yeah stripped out the little the little thread on it, which means um, end up having to hold it on with a little nut. And if it doesn't work, then we'll have to do something else. Okay, so. Having re-strung it now, I'm going to tune it up to pitch approximately. Now, first thing I'm going to just check is the height of the action here, because before I tighten everything up, I, I want to set that if I can, or reset it, because everything's been moved. So it's potentially a little bit too low. I don't know what it's doing on that side. Probably the same. I'll just have to go for tuning it up now and see where they stand in a minute. Okay, so I'll just take another quick look at this end. I want to get this adjusted before we go too far into tightening things up and stretching things out. So, one point three or something like that on this one, and one point five on that one. That should be right. I'm just going to give this a little pull. Make sure it gets back on its saddle notch. The um the notching business, you know, probably would be just as well to buy a set of notched, ready notched saddles. But I've sort of um, just jumped the gun. Really, work with what we've got.
that's the only one that I want to take up a fraction. Um, my fingers already. Right. So now I'm going to do some um, stretching. Just get my hands clean. Looks like um, Roger, who owns this site, has let it to uh, caravan or campers. Weekend family campers. Well, it's definitely the Volkswagen crew. So there, there's people camping in fields nearby and there's people in uh, campers on the site here. So that was... Uh, Looks like Cornwall is going to be full of tourists all heading to the sea. Don't blame them because right now I could be, I could do with jumping in the sea anywhere. Okay, for stretch. Okay, I'm going to call that done. This uh, beastie has been a challenge. And I have to say, um, in part because of the, the finishing, you know, well, a big part to do with the finishing uh, quality. Um, and it's a shame because, you know, I've, I've always had, well, I've had a fairly positive sort of impression of Gordon Smith, mainly because I want to, you know, because because they're British made. Um, and I don't know, you sort of, you want to like them. So look, I've had to refinish the whole of the back of the neck and the sides on this to stop it coming off any further. Mercifully, this is, um, you can see, partly right where it went through to wood. Um, it's almost impossible to make it, um, you know, completely invisible you can you know obviously I built it back up and, and built it back up but there's two places that we went through where it just disappeared and actually it was much wider than that it was a big area but that was the that was right through into the wood um, and so it was well here so you know it's it's sort of quite a lot of rescuing work and it's not perfect coloring you know I've had to have had to stain it to get it to look half decent but we got there in the end, fresh finish, the dirt and worn through has gone from the, the board there. Got some extra weight in the body, um, I fitted the scratch plate, uh, checked everything, put an adjustable tusk nut on, um, We've not adjustable, sorry, well, yeah, put a tusk nut on and then we've got a replacement, or no, the original brass uh, thing here, which I'm going to kind of roll up a bit in a piece of paper to keep it sort of safe. Let's stick it to there. That's 
a fresh scratch plate with no um I can make sure this doesn't touch the finish at all I don't want any blasted papers touching finishes there you go and there there we have it okay so yeah that's um that's a fairly difficult thing um also because of not really being able to work the, the, do the re-radiusing the uh, sorry reprofiling the neck um well, yeah re-radiusing it is slightly difficult to get it um, perfectly flat and so it's got a little bit of a hump going on at the top end here um, in the wood uh, which well I have to tell you it's you know this is quite amazing it's it's not just the wood it's uh sorry it's not just one place it's actually it's actually a dip and that's why that fret is in that dip it's a twist in the wood and there's nothing I can do about it short of taking everything off and re-radiusing it to 12 inch is so um, yeah, working with the limits of what we got here. Um, so not a massively favourable impression of the Gordon Smith, particularly this, as I say, this, this um, is right here. The neck goes like that, and that's why that one is down in a dip. Um, it's more. I, I didn't really see it before. I didn't assumed. Uh, I assumed it would be good, but actually, if I look at it, it's uh, pr it's fairly pronounced. So that's what I've been struggling with, and that's as good as it will get. Um, that's as good as it's going to play with the conditions that we've got so done my very best uh, that's going to need to go in a case and go home tonight right thanks for watching uh, it's been a long and painful one um, hmm there we go